Good evening, and welcome to this special seminar presented by the Canadian Antisemitism Education Foundation, the Clarion Project, the Institute for Global Studies in Antisemitism and Policy, and Muslims Facing Tomorrow. Our program this evening is entitled Foreign Funding of Universities, Undermining Democracy and Spreading Antisemitism, and is supported by our friends and colleagues at Canadians for Charter Rights and Freedoms, the Atlanta Jewish Coalition, Doctors Against Racism and Antisemitism, The Lawfare Project, Combat Antisemitism, and the Canadian Coalition Against Terrorism. We thank our support organizations and all of you for joining us. What the presenting and supporting organizations have in common is a desire to stop anti-democratic influences on our campuses across North America. Influences that are felt in the biased teaching by some academics, the hiring and promoting and other policies in some specific departments, the anti-Western curricula that purports to be about social justice, and the very trend in devaluating Western cultures, values, history, and the contributions of Western, read European, American, Canadian, Judeo-Christian contributions to society. Such distortions are actually disinformation campaigns that deny historical truth invalidate other academics, shut down the expression of certain viewpoints, intimidate some students, and even have led to punishing behaviors by the foreign funded parties. But more importantly, some of the funding is tied to organizations and causes that support terror. Regimes that are opposed to the rule of law and democracy and to organizations and individuals that spew Jew hatred. The Canadian Antisemitism Education Foundation is a registered Canadian charity that for over 20 years has been shining a light on increasing antisemitism in its many guises and has been educating Canadians about the history and legal rights of the Jews to the land of Israel, while also defending freedom of expression and the rights of other persecuted minorities. ISGAP is a global organization dedicated to scholarly research into the origins, processes, and manifestations of global antisemitism and other forms of prejudice, including various forms of racism, as they relate to policy in an age of globalism. The Clarion Project is a nonprofit organization dedicated to exposing extremist groups and individuals which pose a threat to the security of North America. Muslims Facing Tomorrow is a Canadian nonprofit organization that exists to reclaim Islam for the purpose of securing peace for all people and exposing extremism, fanaticism, and violence in the name of religion. This includes advancing the principle of individual rights and freedoms among Muslims and encouraging Muslims to embrace ideas of openness, equality, and equal respect for all people and faiths and freedom of speech. It gives me great pleasure to introduce our moderator, Rahil Raza, a world-renowned human rights activist, a journalist, and founding president of Muslims Facing Tomorrow, and co-founder of Canadian Citizens for Charter Rights and Freedoms, and a board member of Rebel Media. Born in Pakistan, Rahil loudly defends her adopted home, Canada, from the Islamists who operate to undermine our freedoms here and abroad. She features in the film Covert Cash, which I hope you all watched in advance. Rahil, welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much, Andrea. I will begin right away by introducing our distinguished panel. Ryan Morrow is Clarion Project's National Security Analyst, Shulman Fellow and Director of Clarion Intelligence Network. A Professor of Homeland Security, Counterterrorism and Political Science, Ryan is a consultant to government agencies and policymakers and leads a team of OSINT researchers who provide evidence and on extremist groups and individuals to federal and state law enforcement agencies. Ryan has made over a thousand appearances on international radio and TV programs from both the political left and right, including frequent segments on Fox News Channel, Al Hura, CCTV, Voice of America, Wall Street Journal Live, and more. He's been widely published and quoted in outlets like the New York Times, the Washington Post, USA Today, The Hill, Roll Call, and Daily Caller. Dr. Charles Asher Small is the founder and executive director of the Institute for the Study of Global Antisemitism and Policy and a research scholar at St. Anthony's College, Oxford University. 
Dr. Small is a prominent scholar and public speaker specializing in the fields of contemporary anti-Semitism, including the delegitimization of Israel and notions of Jewish peoplehood, social and cultural theory, globalization and national identity, social movements, political Islam, racisms, including anti-Semitism. Charles has convened groundbreaking academic seminar series in the emerging field of contemporary anti-Semitism studies at many distinguished institutions. He is the author of books and articles, including the six volume, Global Antisemitism, A Crisis of Modernity. Michael Bass CPA is an ex South African Canadian CPA and investigative accountant. He has held several senior financial positions with large Canadian and US companies, including Director of Finance, Kroll Canada, and Head of Worldwide SOX Compliance for Kroll Inc. New York. Michael has been involved in numerous financial investigative assignments with Kroll Inc. and other unrelated corporations and people. He was previously Senior Research Fellow, now collaborating with ISCAP, researching and reporting on the foreign funding of US colleges from 1982 to 2019. The foreign funding findings were presented to the DOJ in DC on, in July 2019, and subsequent follow-up investigative reports were recently published. Previously, he was a board member and treasurer for CFTRL in Toronto, Ontario. Ryan, let's begin with you. Can you tell us a little about Covert, Covert Cash and how the film came to be made? Sure. So Covert Cash is Clarion Project's new documentary that's available on YouTube and has now been seen by millions of people. And it's all about this topic of foreign financing of American universities and colleges. And if it's happening in the United States, you better believe it's happening in Canada and other schools around the world. Um, and basically what sparked it was a research project uh, that Alex Van Ness, one of our analysts, and I did together where we went through the declared foreign donations to US universities and colleges. And I emphasize declared, uh, the tiny portion that academia felt uh, that they were comfortable declaring, even though by law they're supposed to declare um, everything above $250,000. And when we were running through the numbers, um, as pessimistic as we are, uh, we were shocked by what we found, the sheer number of billions billions of dollars coming in from foreign countries. Roughly one third of what was declared came from countries like China, Russia, Qatar, Saudi Arabia, Turkey, and um, other places like that, even like Venezuela and Syria. And, and this money was coming in and there was no explanation of why. Uh, so even when they do obey the law, uh, what we found is that well, we still don't know what the money's going towards, so we just know that the transaction happened. Um, and the Department of Education has done some investigating into this, um, which has, of course, caused the schools to realize that they're not above the law, and so they've been disclosing more and more donations since. But according to the Department of Education, which calls this uh, lack of transparency a black hole, um, only about 300, actually less than 300, of the approximately 6,000 schools in the United States obeyed the law. Now, maybe I'm just a jerk when I think this way, but I feel like schools are good at accounting. Um, anyone who's had to pay tuition and deal with student loan debt, they know that the schools do a good job of following their numbers. And they also have lawyers. So why didn't they disclose the entirety of these amounts. What, what is it that they're hiding? Is it just sheer arrogance or is it uh, is there something more nefarious? And we don't know what all that money is about um, because it's just too much to go through um, to try to find. But even just with a minor investment of time into trying to find out what the purpose of these transactions is, uh, there were just frightening things that were found out. Um, the most commonly known would be the Confucius Institutes, which is, are basically a propaganda and spy base for the communist Chinese regime uh, that have been established on over 100 college campuses in the United States. Uh, and that's with the communist Chinese government openly saying, hey, this is part of our propaganda battles. And it's just the fact that the United States is ignorant or reckless or too politically correct, whatever, 
that we allow this to happen. We allow them to just walk in through the front door and funnel money into the universities in order to wage what they acknowledge is ideological warfare against us. It's, sh it's really shocking. Um, and so we're hoping that this results in change um, coming from pressure from the Department of Education as is happening, but more importantly, that people get involved and demand answers from their schools, because after all, uh, you're the customers. Um, rem remember that. Uh, these schools may act entitled and like they're above the law, but uh, they're supposed to be catering to you. You're the clients and the customers. Thank you. Thank you, Ryan. I'll come back to you with the follow-up questions. Meanwhile, Charles, what was behind the study conducted by ISCAP to identify foreign funding, and to whom did you present the study results? So thank you, and um, I'm honored to be here, and thank you, and thank Andrea for organizing this event. And I know there's a lot of people attending, and many organizations were involved in this. So I think it's wonderful, and, and I'm honored to be here. So if I can start off with uh, one statement, and I know there's over 250 people watching, if people can take away one thing, the attack on Jewish people, we all know that universities have become a purveyor of anti-Semitism. Our children, our grandchildren, students and faculty know that this is becoming a hostile environment. And perhaps as Natan Sharansky said in 2003, the universities are becoming the front line in the struggle against anti-Semitism globally. He said this to Prime Minister Ariel Sharon when he returned from American and Canadian universities in 2003, that this is the most important battleground. <clears throat> so the question is why is anti-Semitism so pervasive in universities, in the classroom, intellectually, and also on the campuses uh, and the atmosphere, the politics and among the student body? And it's largely, in my view, the, the source of this is funding from the Muslim Brotherhood. The Muslim Brotherhood is a reactionary social movement. And if anybody's concerned about anti-Semitism, please familiarize yourself with this reactionary social movement that started in Egypt roughly 100 years ago that fused a very narrow reactionary view of Islam with European anti-Semitism. They took the protocols of the elders of Zion and even Nazi ideology and fused it into this movement that calls for the elimination of anybody that's different than this very narrow view of Islam. So we should become familiar with it. So the Muslim Brotherhood, led by Yosef Kawadawi, Yosef Kawadawi repeatedly says that the true believer needs to complete the work of Hitler. The true believer needs to finish the work of Hitler. Yosef Kawadawi, the head of the Muslim Brotherhood, started Islamic studies at Oxford University. He was the founding member of the founding director of the Board of Trustees. The Muslim Brotherhood has infiltrated American universities for many decades. In fact, a stronghold was in American universities going back to the 1950s and 60s when exiled Egyptian intellectuals uh, ended up in, in American universities. So this is the cause of anti-Semitism to a large extent. We came about this uh, project by mistake. I was running a research center at Yale University. It was the first research center in the history of North American universities that dealt with anti-Semitism. The fact that it took until 2006 to establish such an institute in North, at a North American university should be a study in and of itself. Why did it take so long to create the first center at a university on anti-Semitism in 2006? To make a long story short, we were closed down in 2011, despite having uh, an amazing group of people producing articles, conferences, symposiums, seminars, we were a very vibrant, successful institute, and we were closed. And for the first time in the history of Yale, the, the center was closed, and the academic review, the review committee's report on our work at Yale was deemed classified. This was the first time in the history of Yale that an academic review committee of an entity was deemed classified. So none of, the, none of the scholars, philanthropists, administrators ever saw the content of this report. I went to Stanford University in 2012. I was offered a fellowship there at the Hoover Institution. I was there as a Corette Fellow. And one evening, by mistake, I was looking through emails, and I found an email written by a man named Charles Robin Hogan. Charles Hogan was very antagonistic to us. He was a vice president of Yale when I was there and very antagonistic to the Zionist fascist apartheid entity that we were running at Yale, studying anti-Semitism around the world, including the Middle East. 
So I never checked him out. One night I, I Googled him a, a year after we were closed. And I saw that he worked for a pharmaceutical company in Cambridge, Massachusetts, uh, that was owned by a man named called Ben Mufaz. And Ben Mufaz sued Yale over a book by Matthew Levitt uh, that Matthew wrote about uh, Hamas. And they settled out of court. Uh, and three months after they settled out of court, the vice president of this pharmaceutical company, Charles Hogan, became the vice president at Yale. We should remember that the owner of the pharmaceutical company owned uh, companies and chemical companies in Sudan, for example, that was bombed by the Clinton administration for supporting terror. He is a known terror financer. So Charles Hogan comes to Yale. He hires a woman called Aletta Wagner. Aletta Wagner worked for a man called Ella Moody. Ella Moody went to jail for 20 years. He was connected to the Clinton administration. He's in jail for 20 years for running guns. So I do social theory <clears throat> and philosophy. And in about 30 minutes of Googling, I found all these connections, the Arab Bankers Association, different foundations, and uh, all sorts of funding going to universities. But I didn't understand what I found. And I started going to experts on counterterrorism and terror financing in the United States, in Israel, people, scholars that I really respect. And I said, is this anything relevant? Because I really didn't understand completely what I found. And to make a long story short, it was clear that I found the tip of an iceberg by mistake. And I started working with scholars in Israel and North America. Michael played a key role. He joined our project, uh, I think around 2014 or, or so, if I'm not mistaken. And Michael with his expertise <clears throat> started looking at research uh, for the first time. This was the first time that anybody started looking at these connections within uh, university funding. And Michael's amazing work, he discovered uh, for the first time three bill, over approximately $3 billion in undocumented funding. That's fantastic. And, Thank and you. I'll, I'll, just, I'll, I'll just, just for 30 more seconds, we took this research for several, for several years. I was knocking on doors in Washington. And eventually, people in the Department of Justice uh, took our research seriously. We presented our research, Michael was with me in July of 2019 at the De Department of Justice. Uh, the Secretary of State was there, the head of the FBI, Homeland Security, the head of the Department of Education. And for the first time we presented our findings and this was July, 2019. In November, 2019, the government decided, so some of the people that I've been meeting with decided to launch a federal investigation. And as Ryan was saying, this is why for the first time, more than 90 universities have disclosed their funding for the first time in the last several months because of the federal investigation. The preliminary report, which was launched two weeks ago in Washington, I was there at the Department of Education, they are now up to $6.8 billion. And from my contacts, people that I've been working with to write the report, and the next report, which will be out in about five months, we're going to find, I understand, this is from my sources, there'll be approximately $18 billion of funding coming from foreign funding, and the predominant amount of it coming from the Middle East is from Qatar, from the Muslim Brotherhood. And they are closing down research centers, and they're promoting through soft power, anti-Semitism, anti-Zionism, and also other forms of anti-democratic values. And this is why our departments, our education, they fund publishing houses, they fund scholars, they, they endow chairs, and this is why when our young children go to university, they come with a very problematic view of Jewish peoplehood, of Israel, and of uh, some of the, the problematic matters that confront our society, anti-democratic values. Thank, Thank you, Charles. That's fascinating. And we'll have to come back to you to hear more. But in the meantime, Michael, I wanted to ask you if such an investigation has been conducted also in Canada, and what do you know about it? Thanks, Rahil. Um, the short answer to that is no. There hasn't been such an investigation. And the, the main reason I'll, I'll make this fairly brief um, is that unlike the US where the, the Higher Education Act mandates the reporting of all funds coming in from foreign nations over 250,000, Canada does not have any such requirement. So there has not been any reporting of this kind of thing at all. Um, there are sources, the US has a lot more sources and they are public sources and naturally the Department of Education reports contain the bulk of the funding 
um, I was able to go through 990s, which is the tax returns that certain corporations, certain um, universities have to file. But in Canada, apart from Statistics Canada, which has just global figures, um, and they are small figures compared to the US, but they're still important. There is no source in order to get this information and do an investigation. It is needed. And I think this is going to highlight the fact that Canada and something coming out of this, hopefully, will be that Canada will try at a province level, unlike the US, where it's at a federal level, the reporting of all funding from foreign nations, um, especially those that are hostile to our values and our ideology. That, uh, thank you so much. Uh, as a Canadian, I find all this of great concern, and I'm glad that we are talking about it. Ryan, yeah. you had mentioned uh, in your um, introduction that um, the Department of Education's investigation uh, you know, went along, but could you uh, quickly, briefly tell us who ordered this to be done, the Department of Education investigation in the U.S.? Well, I don't know the name of the specific official that actually said, hey, go do this. Um, but there had been some reporting going on preceding the um, public announcement of these investigations, after which, as um, the others alluded to, the schools decided, hey, maybe now's a good time to obey the law. Um, and then suddenly they started declaring these donations billions and billions of dollars worth. And then obviously you can look at their forms that, that are revised, compare them to the ones that they, that the declarations that previously happened, and you can see what they chose not to declare. Um, and it can very often tell a very interesting story there or be a clue as to what that story is. For instance, if a school um, through those identified omissions um, declared a bunch of money coming from an ally of the US but then somehow forgot to declare the money coming from communist China, um, then that's kind of damning um, and it makes it of greater concern. Um, there is a parallel investigation going on um, by the Justice Department uh, targeting Chinese influence, um, uh, specifically illegal financial dealings with professors, uh, the most prominent one being Dr. Charles Lieber, um, I believe it was at Harvard. Um, he was like the top chemist in the United States, and it turned out that in addition to the tons of money he was getting, grant money from the U.S. government, this wasn't like a poor guy, he was getting tons more money from the communist Chinese government and illegally not declaring it, uh, and was helping them with a lab, and so that's part of not just influence, I mean, certainly there's influence there, um, but espionage. And as everybody knows, it doesn't have to be espionage targeting explicitly military technology, because where does military technology come from? Non-military technology and knowledge. Um, so you can, they can succeed in getting professors, and there's been uh, a number of them arrested across the country at this point. Um, now, some people may hear that and be overly comforted, say, all right, well, there's an investigations into the failure to disclose this funding. Schools are coming forward now. Um, there's some efforts on, on parts of members of Congress for greater transparency, which I still think are inadequate, but it's an improvement. The Justice Department's arresting professors who are getting this Chinese money. Don't be comforted by all that. Um, because the problem is so massive, I don't know that the U.S. government even has the resources to put, um, to really keep, get a handle on all of it, and it only includes a portion of the money that's coming into universities and colleges. So, for example, if the Muslim Brotherhood Front called the International Institute of Islamic Thought, which gets a ton of foreign funding but is a domestic U.S.-based nonprofit, sends millions of dollars to a school, as they are known to do, to fund specific Islamic programs and professors, is that required by law to be disclosed as a foreign donation? No. That all happens and it won't show up in those files because it's coming from an American group. Where's that American group getting the money from? Foreign sources. So the numbers that we're talking about here is re really the funding that's just coming in right through the front door the stuff that's a real slap in the face, saying to you Americans, hey, you are so reckless, you're so stupid, that we can come in and we don't even have to hide some of it. The universities may hide it, but for a lot of those foreign countries, it's like not really hiding it. Now, if you wanna be craftier and you wanna set up fronts in the United States, um, that's something else you can do. And we have even less transparency surrounding that. So yeah. um, I, I would keep, I would caution people to, yes, cheer the success that's going on, 
So understand that this is a massive problem and there's a myriad of ways for Thank our you. adversaries to influence the next generation of students. Thank you. Thank you, Ryan. Michael, while you were investigating this issue, what sort of uh, issues did you encounter along the way while trying to access information and what are the most important findings you identified? Um, I'd have to go back a little bit on this uh, briefly. I started collecting reports. The Department of Education would issue a report twice a year. Um, the reports would not stay up once the, pre the, the subsequent report was published. So for anybody to really gather these over a period of time, uh, very difficult, and they always covered a six-year period. So there were segments that were being looked at by, by various groups that were publishing reports and, and looking into it. I managed to obtain from, in 2013, the very first report that I got, which took funding back to 1986, all the way up to 2013, and the five years after that. So I've kept on updating that report every time a new report has been issued by the department. And from, at the time we went to uh, Washington in uh, July last year, the total, was, total overall total that had been reported, as Ryan had mentioned, not, uh, not what was actually happening was 15 billion. At the moment, um, there was a report issued two weeks ago, two reports came out two weeks ago, the latest, I've incorporated those, we're now up to 27 and a half billion dollars of reporters funding. Um, the difficulty, as I said, was actually getting those reports. According to a Senate report I saw recently looking into the Confucius Institutes, the Department of Education does not keep electronic records beyond or prior to the current six years, which just boggles my mind. Um, I was able to put together something that covers 36 years or so, and the department themselves don't have that. So once I was able to get that, I, would, I was able to show, we looked particularly at Qatar and the Doha Education City, which has been reported by a number of people, a major, major source of funding coming into the US. Uh, focused on those, and just a brief look at the numbers um, over a period of uh, 12, 13 years since they started showed huge gaps of reporting. And these are contracts that are entered into by the, con the colleges where they were getting annual amounts, regular annual amounts, every single one of them. And yet looking at it on the screen, you would see five or six years where not a single dollar was reported by some of these colleges. Um, I then got the opposite side, the, the 990s that the universities are filing, which are all coming to them, audited statements, and these are real numbers. Looking at those, comparing to what was shown by them to the Department of Education, it was about a three billion just for these education facilities, three billion dollars shortfall. Um, just one thing I would say: the hardest thing in getting information oversight, there was no oversight or checking or controls of what was being reported. Just, and just being recorded and, and published by the department. That whatever they were getting, they were published. Nobody was checking, nobody was looking. And I think that's another thing that even though they've adjusted as of this month, their reporting needs to be looked at. Thank you. Um, Charles, you had mentioned uh, that, you know, anti-Semitism is a byproduct of foreign funding. Can you um, tell us if this is part of the funders intent? Is this that they are putting in this funding specifically to promote anti-Semitism? And what do you think we can do to counter this? Right. So I think on the one level, there's definitely a, a strong correlation between the soft power of the Muslim Brotherhood. There's a lot of cash that they have. And it's definitely influencing Middle East studies and now other mainstream sort of uh, social sciences. The, 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 the philosophical and political moment has been influenced, I think, by the soft power uh, significantly. And then I think at the intellectual level, I don't want to get too abstract, you have people like Michel Foucault and Edward Said, who are very important um, intellectuals. And they, in the, in, the, in the late 1970s, when they were in Paris, they were spending time with uh, people from the, um, the Iranian revolutionary movement at the time in France when they were in exile. And Said and Foucault saw the Iranian revolution as something that would be akin for the Islamic world as what enlightenment and the French re revolution was to the European and Western world. So they were touting this uh, among intellectuals, they were anti-American and they were going to bring enlightenment to the Islamic world. So there's a whole 
sort of blind spot intellectually to the contradictions that were taking place in the Middle East and in other uh, Islamic countries, how minorities were being treated, how women were being treated, how gay people were being treated, and how anti-Semitism was at the core of this sort of reactionary social movement. So we have the intellectual side going on, and I think in the name of anti-Western hegemony, you have Islamist, um, and sort of the radical left and the radical Islamist, the Red-Green Alliance, which has a, an influence, a strong influence, if not a dominant influence, in academia today. So we have this intellectual movement that was sort of funded in a way through soft power by, by the Muslim Brotherhood. And I think this is happening intellectually. And we did a report last year on the Students for Justice in Palestine at American universities. And we know some funding is coming into it. The, the Students for Justice of Palestine came out of the Muslim Student Association. The Muslim Student Association was a direct connection to the Muslim Brotherhood. It was the Muslim Brotherhood and American universities. And so the funding is coming into these movements. And the, again, the students, the progressive in quotation students are aligning themselves with um, the Students for Justice in Palestine. And we also know that elements, not the entire thing, and it's a very important uh, thing to know, there's the organic Black Lives Matter, and there's an organized Black Lives Matter, and there's a strong connection with the Nation of Islam, uh, Louis Farrakhan and his crew, the Students for Justice in Palestine, and the radical elements in the Black Lives Matter. And this rhetoric of uh, anti-Zionism, anti-Israeli uh, anti politics, demonizing Jewish notions of who they are as a people, this has become mainstream in the discourse in universities for, for a generation at least. And now we can see we remain silent on the anti-Semitism at universities. We remain silent in the demonization of Israel for generations. And now we see the discourse entering into the most important halls of power and of governance in the United States, in the Congress, in the Senate, in the media of record. This type of systemic, and I'm choosing my words carefully, systemic anti-Semitism particularly in the United States at this moment, the radical right, the radical left, and the Islamist is extraordinarily problematic. And it's time that our community, the Jewish community unites. And I think people who are concerned about human rights should see this as a threat. Elie Wiesel always taught us that anti-Semitism begins with Jews, but it never ends with Jews. That once this form of hatred is unleashed upon society, it does not know any bounds. And We've tolerated anti-Semitism for far too long, and we can see the erosion or the attack on the democratic center, and it's deeply troubling. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Charles. Michael, when you were doing your investigations, who did you find to be the biggest funders from foreign countries into American universities? Well, Qatar, for a start, is obviously the biggest. Um, about 3.9 billion has been reported about another one and a half billion that I've been able to identify hasn't been reported. And there's, as Ryan was saying and Charles saying, there's got to be a lot more. Um, China, 1.8 billion, Saudi Arabia, 1.7 billion, um, and a bunch of others. I can give you a number that the top colleges, uh, the top nations of, of, the, of the 27 billion that have come in so far, about 56% of it has come from just 14 nations. And some of them, like Bermuda, for example, and that, that was not even correctly allocated or reflected, are uh, not something we'd be concerned about. But those ones mentioned, Qatar, Saudi Arabia, United Arab Emirates, they total about 6 billion. You add on China, it's close to 8 billion just from those four or five nations. Okay, thank you. Well, Qatar has been on top of the list for a very long time. Yeah. Uh, Ryan, with um, the investigation that uh, you did for uh, Clarion, can you tell us how your information has been shared and if it is being accepted by government authorities? Sure. Um, well, like the others were talking about, uh, the Department of Education is doing an investigation. They shared information with um, the Department of Education and the Justice Department to help uh, get that going. Certainly, there's people on both sides of the political aisle that Clarion Project talks to and shares information with in regards to this type of thing. Um, and, you know, beyond this as well. Um, but if I could, there's, there's one quick microcosm that I think is worth sharing. Um, because those who are skeptical and watching this will say, oh, well, what's the money going towards it? Like, to give you a really specific example of something that happened in the United States, 
uh, there was a huge transaction from Qatar to Northwestern University, $340 million. And it was specifically um, part of the journalism section of the school. And so we're looking to try to see just basically by random what that was about. Um, and what we found for, from the public statements of the school and also you know, the, who sent the money over uh, in Qatar is that it was actually a program to essentially hire the school's journalism section to expand Al Jazeera, the premier anti-American, anti-Semitic propaganda station in the world. And everybody knows that, especially if you're receiving $340 million to work with them. Um, I would assume you, you at least know that. Um, and it's really, at least morally, I think, treasonous. Legally, it may not be, but morally, it's treasonous. There is a conscious decision there to take money um, and in exchange jeopardize the United States as well as your students who you're sending to help expand Al Jazeera. Now, it gets even worse uh, because there was a controversy in September 2019 where the president of Northwestern University had to actually condemn one of his own professors, Justin Martin, uh, because on the anniversary of 9-11, he decided it was a good idea to tweet anti-American things. Specifically, here's what he tweeted. Happy 9-11. More than 8,441 civilians died in Yemen this year, helped by U.S. arms dealt to Saudi Arabia and the UAE. The U.S. is complicit in far more terror than it has ever suffered. I mean, the, the implication there is essentially that the U.S. got what it deserved on 9-11. Horrific statement. And so we looked into his background, and by looking at his bio, what we found is that he had gotten two huge grants totaling over $1.3 million dollars from the Qatar Foundation, a terrorism-linked, essentially a Muslim Brotherhood front in entity in Qatar. So this radical professor gets $1.3 million in two grants since 2014 from this terror-tied entity and the students who are basically paying for to attend his class, the parents who are paying, had no idea that the product they were getting was tainted by radical Islamic money. And neither of those grants were reported as foreign transactions. And that, again, is what we found just by putting a little bit of time, kind of randomly looking into some of these transactions. Imagine if you had dozens or hundreds of people looking at the foreign financing in their communities and saying, it's my patriotic obligation to at least contact the school and say, what was, what was this transaction about? And I, and I think the results would be absolutely startling if people did that. So, so following up on this Northwestern Qatar Al Jazeera connection, uh, Charles, uh, can you tell us something about the story of Qatar suing the Texas Attorney General? Um, I'm not, uh, I know about the case, but I'm not an expert at the case. I know that Q Qatar gave uh, almost one billion, Michael discovered this actually, almost one billion dollars to Texas A&M of all places. And what's interesting, Texas A&M as a university has strong uh, research connections to the Los Al Alamos uh, Military Research Center. So it's an interesting place to invest $1 billion. But I would also like to follow up on what Ryan was saying. I think in, in a sense, um, the courting of the Muslim Brotherhood by, particularly in the United States at this point, I think there's even more awareness and, and, and concern in Europe I don't think the, the level of consciousness has reached a, a certain a critical point in the United States. This is still going on sort of quietly. But we have to remember that the relationship of the Muslim Brotherhood in the United States is deep. Um, it's key intellectuals were refugees here. President Morsi, of all people, was a professor in California before he became the, uh, the president of Egypt. So we have to scratch our heads a little bit. Why? How can this happen? Um, the previous American government, the, administer the, the Obama administration, were very instrumental in helping to bring about the elections in Egypt, and they helped to prop up, I would say, and organize the Muslim Brotherhood in the elections. Um, the engagement with Iran, although it's a Shiite country, its intellectual and ideological roots of the Iranian revolutionary regime is connected to the Sunni Muslim Brotherhood. There is a common ideological foundation in both. They pay homage to each other, by the way. So I think we have a serious problem, not just in the universities, but in our society. The CARE and other organizations, lobby organizations that are very close 
uh, and very active in Washington and, and other important institutions, I think we need to take a, a, a step back and understand that these relations are, are significant throughout our society, throughout institutions of power. And if we care about democratic principles, if we care about the idea, whether you're Democrat or Republican, Canadian or American, if you believe, for example, that every citizen ought to be equal under one legal system, that a woman shouldn't be subjugated, that gay people shouldn't be killed, that minorities have the same rights uh, as the majority, that the incitement to exterminate Jews is a problem, then I think we really need to expose, and I would argue, ban the Muslim Brotherhood in the United States of America. It's a terror-supporting organization, it not only destabilizing the United States, but we can see what happened um, in Syria, the, the genocide in Syria, and, and 15 or, or at least 15 million refugees uh, flooding into different parts of the world to Turkey, destabilizing and awakening sort of a reactionary nationalism in Europe. We have to take a step back and, you know, I remember Elie Wiesel's words. I don't think people cared when they were demonizing Israel and the Jewish people, but now we have a global problem. And I think our leaders, our intellectual leaders, our policy leaders, our uh, government officials really need to look at this and see this terror-inspiring, hate-filled, anti-democratic, anti-human rights movement as a real problem in our midst, and we should not tolerate the intolerable. So we know that this funding is negatively influencing and endangering our democracy, whether from foreign corporations or governments. The question that I would like to ask is how and why has this been allowed or caused to occur in the US and Canada? And I'd like each one of you to briefly comment on this. We'll start with you, Michael. Why has this happened? Thanks, Rahil. Um, Canada, um... <laughs> I have no idea why it's happened. There's been obviously very little attention paid to it, and there's been very little publicity of what's been going on. The U.S. has a ton of publicity, um, and there again, why with so much publicity has it been ignored? I really don't know. If I can just point to one thing which none of us have mentioned yet, the Middle East Saudi Associations, many of whom were funded by Saudi Arabia and Qatar, are hotbeds of anti-Semitism. Um, the signatures to the boycotts of Israel, 542 professors have signed. Um, there were 1,022 anti-Semitic incidents at those colleges that had Middle East study associations. Again, these things have all been reported, but for some reason, there hasn't been the will. I would say personally, just as a quick answer to this, the funding has come in as influence funding, and it's kept the administrations quiet and prevented them from taking the necessary action to enforce, enforce codes of conduct and just basic principles of, of justice towards Jewish students and, and mon other minorities, especially Jewish students. So I think that's, that's a serious problem, and it's not being addressed because they've been paid virtually to say nothing, do nothing, look the other way, and that's unfortunate and it's shocking. Ryan, uh, would you like to comment on this and also uh, tell us briefly how this information is going to be disseminated to the American public? Sure. So the, the best way people can uh, share the information um, based on what we've done, at least, is uh, covertcash.com. So we've released a documentary out on YouTube. It's free for everybody. Um, but if you go to covertcash.com, um, you can not only watch the film, but also access uh, the data. And then that will help wake people up because it, when you give it that local flavor and you say, well, this is what's happening in your backyard, or this is where your child is going to school, it, it just makes it a completely different thing. Um, especially if you're paying for that education, um, it, it makes it just downright offensive. Um, as for why nothing's been done, um, I think for some people, they've accepted it as a fact of life if they know about it. Um, in the various issues we grapple with, maybe it's not the number one issue. Um, I think an additional factor is, is that media coverage and the political dialogue um, in the United States is focused on conflict, what makes people the most angry. Now, if you talk to a progressive or you talk to an ultra conservative about this issue, their reaction to this topic is going to be pretty much the same. None of them like it. Uh, there is bipartisan support for doing something about this. There's different ideas in Congress. I've never come across anyone saying, how dare you raise this? 
Um, and that is kind of what the problem is. When everyone agrees about something, it tends to get pushed off to the side because it doesn't get much attention because they're not screaming at each other and demonizing each other. Um, and so th that's why something very common sense like forcing the schools to disclose all transactions or lowering the amount instead of saying 250,000 and above. I personally think that we should change the law so that they have to supply at least a few sentences about what that transaction is for. I think every single taxpayer has a right to know that. And the schools should be criminally held liable if they don't follow a law like that. Um, and then there's various other ideas, but it seems very often that the most common sense measures to our problems are the ones that get bypassed. And I think that's largely due to the media political environment. Charles, um, I'd like you to comment on the, on the same issue, but also do you think that while in North America we are facing this huge crisis, do you think that Europe and UK are facing similar issues? Yeah, they, they certainly are. However, I think, uh, you know, recently there's been movement, I think some the European Union, there's been banning of Hezbollah. I think there is more of an awareness, uh, in a sense, Italy, Germany, France, they've been on the front line. I think the war against democracy in Europe is more pronounced and more uh, stark. And sometimes when you're in a state of conflict, uh, things there's a clarity in that. So I think some of the policies are, are encouraging coming out of Europe. I think Britain is lagging behind, and I think North America is way behind uh, on these issues. But um, And it's also interesting, I think there's a shift, I, and I believe the shift is uh, significant in some of the Sunni countries, in, in Bahrain and the United Arab Emirates, I believe in Saudi Arabia as well, and in other Sunni countries, there is a shifting. I think there's a, there's a great concern about the threat of Iran and also of the Muslim Brotherhood. And um, I know the Saudis did a security assessment about five, uh, about three years ago, and they thought they would only have five years left of stability because of the, the threat of the Muslim Brotherhood on the kingdom. So I think there's a shift, and I think this is why they're making a rapprochement with Israel. And I think there's aware, an awareness emerging in Europe, but I think in North America, we're lagging behind in this. And I'm, I'm concerned that the, the new President of the United States will sort of echo some of the old policies that got us into a mess uh, previously. So I hope, I hope there's an awareness on these issues. But I think um, things are a little bit more advanced in some ways in, in other parts of the world on, on the, the of the of the struggle and its importance. You mean in North America? I think North America is lagging behind. I don't think there's an awareness on anti-Semitism and on on the threat of radical Islam in our society. I think people still perceive this as sort of far away, but it's really, it's in our midst. So all three of you are working through uh, your personal interest and of course with organizations that have done massive amount of research on this investigative reporting, you know, all the data that you've collected. Um, if organizations like the three of yours got together to, to establish policy in both, well, Canada especially, to get the information and demand accountability from universities for any or all foreign funding. How do you think that would pan out? Michael, let's begin with you. Um, it's going to be an issue in Canada. Um, I've already seen a report by CSIS today where they talk about the issues more so from the influence of Chinese um, theft and whatever else is going on. And they mentioned that Canada has shown very little interest in dealing with it. The US, it is being dealt with. So I, I don't know what's going to happen in Canada. The US, according to DOJ report that came out yesterday as well, says they feel they've done tremendously well in countering these things, not necessarily anti-Semitism. They're looking at more the, the, the impact of theft and, and fraud and things like that. So I think it's going to be a pretty hard task and a, an uphill battle to get some action. Yes, but what can the action be in terms of people who are watching this webinar? What can ordinary people do? I think the awareness is very important and speaking out. Um, nobody at, the, at the, our level is going to get anything done. It's going to be done by organizations, by governments, people above us, and they have to be made aware of everybody's concerns and what is going on. I don't know if they, if they care or if they know, but they need to know and they need to be made aware and do something about it. Um, easier said than done, I know. Ryan, have you had any pushback 
in terms of this investigation? Has there been, have there been roadblocks put in your way? There have been lack, a lack of responses from the schools, that's for sure, um, which is to be expected. Uh, there hasn't been any negative blowback that we face because again, this is not controversial, it's common sense. Um, it's one of those things that people can unite around and say that this, ju this just shouldn't be going on. Um, the recommendation I would have for people is um, if you have no time, then at least just share covert cash on social media. That does make a big difference because you never know if someone who has an FBI relative sees it and then what that leads to down the line. Uh, many times you don't know what an impact you have. Um, but if you have a little bit of more time, and, and, but still minimal, um, just reaching out to a university, their media office and saying, I would like, as a, my, my child went there or as a member of the community, I'd like to know what this transaction is about. Um, and then getting no answer or getting an answer is a success either way. Um, looking at the bios of professors at the, that are teaching the classes that your children are taking. Um, and seeing if they've gotten any grant money, if they've said, sometimes they'll actually say it on their resume, they've gotten foreign money from a certain place, like the one professor I mentioned. Um, and as you find that out, you can send it, send that information to us. And it doesn't have to be a national story to be very successful. Sometimes just having that local story um, in some ways is even, even has greater pressure. Um, and so I think that there are many opportunities for successes to be, to be had with a minimal investment in time. It's just a matter of people caring enough to say, you know what, this week I'm gonna spend an hour doing this. And if you have an hour to spare, you might make a major discovery. Right, Charles, do you think that mainstream media is covering this issue well enough, strongly enough uh, so that uh, the masses can understand what is happening because it's the future of the children that is at stake here? No, I don't, I don't think they are. And I, I think just going briefly back to your question on policy, um, I think the fact that, you know, I stumbled into this project and we were able at ISGAP to assemble some amazing people to work uh, collaboratively on this project for many years. And we were able to knock on doors and this, our research, the, the Michael and many scholars from around the world put together. Um, we are, I know our research played a key role in launching a federal investigation, and I think that will shift policy. So I think through research or through advocacy and raising, raising awareness through film and communication, we can actually make a difference. And we live in a democracy, and I think there are um, avenues to pursue, and we, we ought to pursue, and we ought to, you know, get more people in our communities engaged. So there is a way to change policy. And what we're doing at ISGAP is, um, we're bringing scholars from around the world. We're actually launching a seminar series in two weeks in Arabic and also in Spanish, but the Arabic seminar series with simultaneous translation will be fascinating. Leading um, Arab speaking intellectuals and scholars are coming together to deal with anti-Semitism and the threat of political Islam. So we raise awareness. We have other scholars who are continuing our research on follow the money um, in, in, in North America and in Europe. And uh, I think our project actually has uh, people are beginning to replicate it in other parts of the world. So perhaps, you know, we made a small dent uh, in the United States and maybe now other people around the world will start to look at funding. Mm -hmm. And, and if people that. want to access the ISGAP report, is it on the website? Uh, yes, it's on our homepage at uh, www.isgap.org. Okay, I'd like to give each one of you one minute to wrap up. Um, about everything that we've talked about, Michael? Yeah, um, it's, a, it's an uphill battle. It's a major area of concern right now. There are some positive signs I'm seeing coming from more from the administration of government administrations than the university administrations who turn their backs on these things. Um, but we can only do our best and try and keep, as, as everybody has said, to get the awareness out there, to speak up, and to read these things, if the MSM is not putting it out, everybody else has to do their job to get this done. Ryan? Sure, I would just um, echo the previous calls for people to get involved, know that you can make a difference with a minimal investment of time. You don't have to be an expert or have any special skill. We just need more hands, honestly. Um, if you have an hour to spare, I mean, I know that uh, it, it would be tremendously helpful for all of us. 
Um, and then you can also get more involved um, by doing things like signing up for the Clarion Project uh, newsletter, um, because we are doing screenings and events and stuff that we'd love the audience to get involved in. Um, if you like the film and you want to help educate other people. Um, and really, it's much as it, it's easy to become pessimistic about a lot of this stuff because it's so frightening. It's um, 20 hours. But um, I must say that I, over the past year or so, I've gotten on this issue much more optimistic because progress that I really never thought would happen has happened. Um, awareness nationally that I never thought would happen is now happening. Uh, so I think the trend is in our favor. Okay. Charles, any last words? Yeah, just briefly, I would say in uh, 2003, Elie Wiesel said in Canada, actually in Ottawa, that he was very concerned that we were living in a time of great urgency because of the rise of anti-Semitism. And he stopped and he corrected himself and he said, no, we're not living in a time of great urgency. We're living in a time of a great emergency. He was never so terrified by the rise of anti-Semitism since, since 1945 at the end of the Holocaust and Second World War as he was in 2003. And we know today in 2020, the situation is more uh, concerning and more difficult. And I think it's time that our community, the Jewish, I'm appealing now to the Jewish community, the philanthropists in the community, the intellectuals in the community, the policymakers in the community, it's time where all hands are on deck. How can we send our children and our grandchildren to get an education that teaches them to hate themselves or permits the type of anti-Semitism that Michael was just speaking about? How is it that we build buildings on those campuses and spend tens if not hundreds of millions of dollars in donating to those universities when we don't speak up about this profound uh, injustice that's taking place, not only on campus, but in the classroom, what we're learning. And right. I think it's time our community and people who are concerned about human rights take a stand. And if the community is united, there's not, there's not much that will stop us. I would add to that that every single person who is watching this should definitely spread the word, you know, um, get the facts and figures, get the reports, send them out to everyone they know. You have all been extremely informative and uh, thank you all so much. I will hand over to Andrea for the wrap. Thank you so much, Raheel. That was wonderful. You've done a marvelous job of moderating and I thank the panelists for their time and their preparation and of course all the research that they've done. It's been um, eye boggling, mind boggling and eye opening and, and overwhelming. And I appreciate the context in which um, Charles framed it also that we're in a time of emergency. I think it's hard to say that people don't wanna be frightened and they say, you're exaggerating, you're overplaying it. I'm so glad that he has said it with his knowledge and his background, because I'd like to say to the people who are listening that we are wanting your help, that if you wanna volunteer, if you wanna act on things that have been said, you know, whether it's to um, get an idea from Ryan as how to spend an hour doing research or doing advocacy, we will uh, try to facilitate that. So if you get in touch with CAF, I'm Andrea, A-N-D-R-I-A at CAF.ca. I'll ensure that we coordinate some action with the other partners that have put this together. So thank you everybody for your hard work and for bringing this forward. It's um, very important. Thanks, Andrew. Thanks to Thank you. you. Thanks, Thank everyone. you all very much. Thanks, Rahil. Have a nice evening and be safe. Thank you. You too. Bye. Thank you. Bye now.